And I hope that this talk will actually complement what she has presented to you. And I would like to bring it back to something that the G7 this year in Japan, in Isashima, and the Kobe Health Minister's meeting really highlighted, which was on one side universal health coverage, but the other was aging populations and the aging issues, which had never really been brought together in that kind of a form in the G7. And so I'm going to provide you, uh, there are a lot of slides, and a lot of them are really pictures, and I would just like to encourage the young researchers and the older researchers, as you're thinking about this area, that there's really a lot of unanswered questions. So I'm going to try to give you a, a rapid picture of this environment and the kinds of issues that countries are really struggling with and what they will be struggling with for really probably the next 20, 30 years. Um, and we're really at the beginning of this journey. So I want to make sure it's working. So we all know, of course, about the Sustainable Development Goals. We know that universal health coverage is a major target. But what was really revolutionary about this is, is the fact that countries around the world have agreed not only to the target and progressive realization of UHC, and, and I think everyone generally knows what that means now, but also this agenda around equity. And it's the first time that countries have politically accepted this, that this is going to be a major agenda. And that's a very difficult issue for countries to deal with, as we certainly have seen um, in countries I know best, certainly with uh, the recent election in the US, for instance, where the social contract often gets put into question. And so what does that mean, not only for the general population, but also for the aging population, which is going to be the subject of my talk. And the other opportunity of the SDGs is to also think across different sectors, and that's both looking at the social services sector, but also economics, and that's the ministries of finance, it's the pension issues, it's the labor issues that are inherent in this work, and this is going to be a real challenge also for countries to think in different ways. Now, UHC also introduced some new paradigms. In many ways, they're not so new. They're looking, on one hand, a service benefit package is that includes not just a treatment side, but a real emphasis on the prevention side, and therefore, what are the cost-effectiveness arguments of prevention and health promotion, once again. But on the other side is rehabilitation and palliative care. One of the fundamental issues about aging is that it's not a disease. It is something that potentially presents new opportunities for how we organize our health services and our social services over a lifespan of 20 to 40 years of that individual. And they're going to be healthy, and sometimes they're not. But where the economics come into that, and what types of services, what types of providers, what types of organizations, what types of technologies are, are going to be needed, and how we're going to pay for that, is something that is really quite revolutionary for the entire world, given the, the population dynamics, and therefore requires a great deal of innovation. The other major change this year, which I hope you are aware of, but that from the WHO perspective, is that there's a fundamental new paradigm about aging itself. Until now, countries have used a number. If you're 60 or 65, depending on the country, you are therefore old. You are now retired. And that's driven by pensions in the developed countries. In the developing countries, there's no such thing. You had to work to survive, and you have a lot more intergenerational relationships. But fundamentally, from the UN perspective, it was always a number. And so this change, when we have reconceptualized aging to be not about a number, but fundamentally about a functional status and, and an intrinsic capacity of the individual. I won't go into that, because that's really getting away from the talk. But it's just very important, because the arguments that then work backwards toward economics have to do with the fact that we are trying to increase this curve for an individual and then for a population where an individual can have less capacity, less need for health services, and therefore the theory is less health expenditures for the country, for the community, and ultimately for the family as well. And a lot of these costs are borne outside of the, the public sector. They're still borne by the family, or the, particularly, let's say, on dementia, or home health care, and those types of issues that you'll see a bit later. But this is something that is a goal for public policy and for the clinical world and the public health world. But how to do that is going to be a very, very big challenge. And so, as I mentioned in the G7, just a quick reminder is that we have attention to universal health coverage, and we had a whole agenda around healthy aging. Now, how the two come together is really the major challenge for when we think about the fact that, from an aging perspective, 
is that UHC is fundamentally needed. As, as countries are designing their programs, their reform and health system strengthening for all the aspects of universal health coverage and what that means, is that one also has to pay particular attention not only to the needs of this population, but if you don't pay attention to, or let's put it this way, if you build a system on acute care hospitals and a very traditional model based on another type of epidemiology, uh, those countries are going to get it completely wrong and they're not, their UHC programs will not be sustainable because of the financing uh, uh, impact uh, and implications. And aging generally just simply by both volume but also by need, um, particularly as populations get to be 85 years old and 90 years old, uh, will increase health spending. It is also another dynamic that you will see in a moment that it also reduces revenue sources for both the country and then ultimately whatever share is available for the health sector. Now, in many countries, we're also seeing with aging is low fertility, and this has a huge impact on their, the productivity base and the tax base for that country. And so where that actually starts to happen together becomes a huge planning issue, not only for the national level, but for the local level as well. At the same time, we are, both from WHO and from the, the academic community, is that it is not to scare countries for not doing something. That UHC is affordable for aging and for middle-income countries, which will have the greatest growth in aging populations. But that financial sustainability has to be built in from the very, very beginning. So this is a major opportunity for all of you, but also for all of the countries to understand how to, to take that analysis and those, the, the information and to translate that into some viable policy options as well. And therefore, one of the key messages is, is that it requires a priority on thinking about decision making and priority setting and how to use the techniques that Professor Mills had mentioned a bit, but also what's available to you from cost benefit, the cost effectiveness, the demand side on health technology assessment from the perspective of products. And to put that together to really help then the decision makers make the decisions about what are very difficult resource allocations uh, uh, decisions to be made. It's also very useful for planning, of course, for the different types of not only the benefits and the selection of benefits, but the transformation agenda that has to take place. In Japan, for instance, there's a new community-based care model that is being rolled out for aging populations that is not in the institution. So this is going to be new. How do you do this? But linked to that, of course, are a lot of decisions about the economics. And the same is true for health system strengthening because the dialogues that are happening worldwide and in countries is what about the health workforce or which structures are you going to build, the organization of the services to the, t uh, the choice of medicines, just as the, the, the question about polypharmacy and the equity is on another side, is that what kind of incentives are you going to put into your essential drug list or into the reimbursement system that actually helps not only change the behavior, um, but also can drive certain decisions and drive the industry towards another place. And we're seeing this in a great deal for the aging population where this is not just about medicines, it's really about medical and assistive devices and information and communication technology. The social delivery system is not perhaps traditionally part of the WHO mindset, but we cannot forget it, that it is actually very much linked to the nature of the services, but there are different dynamics about both how you pay for those services, how you value those services, and how you then link them together bureaucratically or through governance at the same time. Now underneath all of this is not just health economics, but labor economics as well and I would argue political science, because this is absolutely essential that these numbers don't exist in a vacuum. They have to be brought part of a whole stakeholder uh, process, and UHC does also put an emphasis on community engagement, and how to bring that voice into the process is then what becomes known as political economy. There are a lot of paradigm shifts that I've referred to, and I won't go into this, but I think it is important to keep this in mind that we are dealing in, in a very revolutionary time not just because of the aging populations, but, but what's happening in our healthcare systems, how they're being designed. And what we hear from governments again and again is the whole regulatory process, who's going to pay, what types of incentives. But there are processes in the middle here that are very difficult to manage. And there's a lot of lobbying groups and a lot of vested interests. Um, again, it comes very much around reimbursement systems and how you organize that part of it, which is both the supply side, but 
often, at least in aging, we see is there's very little on the demand side. There's a need to bring in the needs and the preferences of the older population, which may help define what actually then gets, gets created. And there's a whole new area of technology and what that's going to mean for healthcare uh, and the provision of services, and much of that is not within a traditional public health or medical budget line. It will come out of different, either out of pocket or it will come out of different ministries that we normally have not really engaged with. Maybe in the Ministry of uh, in, it's Information or Communication, MEC here, uh, it's industry, and, and so on and so forth. And so to move along um, is that the good news is that particularly from the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, uh, WHO, uh, Help Age International, and a few others, and the ILO, is that there are more documents and more reports looking at aging. And the, the most recent one, beg your pardon, was this Live Long and Prosper, which I guess was perhaps wins the title for best title of the year, from the World Bank, particularly looking at aging in, the, in, in Asia. And I recommend it to you, it came out last year, but it does present some interesting data and some analysis that becomes very useful. So there are lots of opportunities, and the economics in this case is not just also from health or labor, but generally economics of the society. And there's a danger here, because on one side, you hear this from the European Union, you hear this from um, many circles where they have these huge innovation agendas for aging, but it's under this idea of the silver economy, meaning that, wow, we're gonna have two billion consumers there who are gonna be able to spend their money on these various products that are not terribly well regulated. But it becomes certainly true that there is a, a great deal of purchasing power, but there's a great deal of, of danger as well that uh, older persons who are living on fixed incomes are gonna be spending money uh, on things that they don't really know what they're um, spending it on. Uh, and, and there's a whole other kind of market failure that could start to emerge, uh, largely because it's not regulated, but because there's a, a push for this industry side and there needs to be some uh, safety nets in this regard to be wary of. So it's just something to be aware of. The other is that there's a differential level of growth of the population and aging, and this will have an impact ultimately on both the macroeconomic analysis and the microeconomic analysis as well. But one of the big issues has to do with productivity, as you'll see in a few minutes, around dependency ratios and how to use that type of information to predict what is going to be happening in the future, but it will depend partially on the nature of the growth and the types of impact that could be expected in a given country. It's also, of course, the nature of the socioeconomic status of that country to begin with. And just a few pictures to give you some quick kinds of perspectives is that as you're going into the 21st century, um, that certainly the, the population of children is relatively stable. It's the adults, of course, that are declining and then commensurate with that is the growth in the older population. Now, every country would need to analyze its own population dynamics. Um, as you can see here, what's really striking is that by 2050, 40% of the population in both Japan and Korea will be over 65. That's unprecedented in world history. And what that means for economic theory is something that is going to be, uh, I think, a very open question for many countries. Um, as well as the rapid aging that you see for many other countries, Thailand being at 30%, um, and, and so this is the new world, and it is one that countries really are not prepared uh, to start to really understand, and it's that speed of aging uh, that I think we have seen before that we're looking at 20 to 25 years for going from seven to 14% of the population, whereas it took 100 years for many of the European countries, or 60 to 100 years. Um, the other side of the analysis that's emerging but does not have a great deal of still international consensus is this notion of healthy life expectancy, which is, of course, the number of years that a person who is at 65 can expect to live without in reasonably good health. Now, in Japan, with the average life expectancy now is at approximately 83 years between men and women together, is that they're still calculating a gap of about 10 to 12 years uh, between life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Now there's a lot of methodological issues around this and it's still a bit of a struggle, but I think it's very useful because how that translates is the theory that if you have healthy life expectancy, you will therefore use the health system less 
and that is, of course, the great benefit to countries. Now, your job is to analyze this because that is where the, the moving backwards then is to define those types of prevention programs that will have an effect on the actual healthy life expectancies. And that's NCDs, but it's much more than that when you think of the life course. Dependency ratio is another major tool that's used and has been used, and the terminology is not always the best one, but I think generally it's the population, the working population that's supporting both children and those who are over 65. Based a little bit on an old-fashioned premise that if you're over 65, you're dependent and therefore not working, and therefore somehow going to need to be a great deal supported. Now that's likely to change, because this is one of the evolutions that are going to take place, which has to do more around labor economics, which is what is the retirement age? How do you enable people to work longer, particularly if they wish to in those countries? Um, how do you get women into the workforce in some of the countries where they're affected? Um, but the, that would change that equation a bit. But nevertheless, when it's at a low rate is that this becomes known as the, um, uh, the dividend the, uh, from uh, the healthy life. As, and the longer that dividend exists, and the more uh, wealth uh, it accumulates in the society. And this was true in Japan, which began in the 1960s when universal health coverage was absolutely instrumental to creating that productive workforce to have this kind of, um, of, of life cycle. But naturally, as if it becomes a V, it's a much more profound effect for the countries, whereby as they get to be more to a one-to-one -one type of dependency ratio, uh, it becomes a real significant burden. And this is what no one really knows the answer to, but what will be a huge amount of work for, for many people. Um, similarly, uh, is that, again, this will vary by country, is the population growth that will occur so that the population might be increasing as in the case of Japan, but the growth rate is very, very minimal. And you can see the same in China or, or Korea or Germany and a number of other countries. Um, and the effect in Japan is depopulation. So we're at approximately 120 million people in Japan, and it will go down to approximately 90 million people as predicted. Now, many things can change that, but that's the current prediction by 2050. And, and a dire prediction is that it's by 2100 is that the population of Japan will be what it was during the Meiji period. So again, each country will have a different variable on this. And Again, just to make the point I made earlier, is that there are different types of countries at different stages of growth, and this will have an implication on everything else that we can discuss, and, and these slides will be made available to you so you can take some time to, to look at it. But the key message is it's more from a planning and economic and a policy planning perspective. The other side, of course, is the big question, which I'm not going to spend too much time on, but it is also, well, what do you do? How do you change the shape of these curves? And on the one side, it goes, goes back to the, the old um, uh, NCD agenda, which is that what was the secret of uh, this healthy longevity in Japan? They went from 60 years on average in 1960 to about 83 now, and it will in continue to increase. And that was both socioeconomic growth itself um, but it also had a lot to do with hypertension-controlled salt reduction, which led to a decline, a very significant decline in stroke, um, certainly in Japan, but in other countries as well. Um, but this is one of the, the types of examples that you have to start much earlier in life. And this has a huge amount of impact, again, on the, the prevention economics to make the case back to decision makers that you have to invest early to protect that next generation. Right now, we're seeing in the United States, for instance, and perhaps some European countries, that the current uh, epidemic of obesity and diabetes will actually lead to the fact that this, the younger generation will have a less of a life expectancy than their parents or grandparents just because that, that's not controlled. So this is not a guarantee that countries who've had made some uh, gains uh, and, and there are huge inequalities related to this. Uh, this is an area of work that the Kobe Center has spent a lot of time on looking at health equity measurement uh, in a very practical way at country level using a determinants of health approach. Uh, you have questions on that, we can discuss that. And, uh, but it's, I think that principle applies to all of the discussions around universal health coverage. So whenever you see data, there's a real need to disaggregate that data by poverty, by the, 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 the income strata, but also by gender, by the other determinants of health. It is absolutely essential. Uh, during the MDG period, it was not done. Uh, with the SDGs, it needs to be done because it's very much part of that UHC agenda. 
but there needs to be the tools available to be applied to actually understand the patterns and the causes that lead then to some interventions. And they do exist, but they really need to be applied uh, systematically. And I think it also starts often with the researchers themselves to make sure that that data is there. Uh, here in Japan, there's a Professor Kondo who has the J Japanese uh, Gerontological Evaluation Survey, uh, which is a longitudinal survey of self-reported data for an aging population. But he based it on the determinants, and so it's interesting to look how they have worked, that the team has worked, to take that data and to use GIS mapping then to apply it to a local area so you can see the patterns, not only for where people say are self-reporting that they're involved in physical exercise or nutrition or what type or how often they have depression, but also what's the, the whole equity pattern that's happening there. And certainly in Japan, what we've seen recently is the emergence of inequities, both due to a long-term recession, but also particularly with an aging population that is going to be more subject to inequities to begin with. So this is, um, um, again, around just high blood pressure to make that point. Now, um, another aspect of this, which is perhaps sometimes a little bit more difficult, it may not be difficult to measure, but how to interpret it and how to link it back to the economic analysis has to do with the social status of persons who are living, um, uh, who are elderly. And it has often to do with whether they're living independently. Uh, this has to do ultimately also with issues of intergenerational transfers and has to do with um, uh, support systems from the public sector because there's been a shift, as you'll see in a moment, from often what is the home responsibility and the family responsibility to the state. And this is a very, very uh, hot debate in many, many countries and one that has really not been settled. And I think it will become a very important issue under UHC as countries plan is what is that balance? And of course, countries are very scared because it means another additional burden on their uh, health and social service budget. And so here's an example where if you were, this is from Japan and, and courtesy of Professor Takemi, um, is that from 1951 to 2009, what we're seeing is that people are not dying at home as they used to, they're dying in, in a, in a uh, facility, which of course then increases the cost of the health system as well. So this push not only to increase, to have people live at home for as long as possible is not only about their dignity and their well-being, but it also has a health economic implications as well. And then behind that are what types of systems we put into place. And of course, linked to this is the increase in the number of nursing homes in uh, Japan in approximately 20 years, which is quite dramatic. So aging will increase health spending, um, and certainly this is from the OECD, that uh, what was interesting is that many countries that had achieved UHC already had aging populations. So it's not an excuse that you can't do it or that you're too afraid to, if you will, that countries really need to start right now. And Japan has been saying to the world, we did this when this country was poor in 1961. And it was essential to the growth. And this has been an argument that I think has been generally well accepted, but it's interesting also from an aging population of, of what is um, possible for many countries who find themselves where Japan was when it achieved UHC, uh, it's, it's at the same level. And so that's the good news in some ways. Um, and there's a lot of learning there. Now, similarly, particularly from the OECD countries, we do see patterns of very significant increases in cost of the health system um, once they start to hit certainly 75 and above. And with more and more populations becoming older, uh, you can expect to see those costs rise as well. Now, of course, that, again, that equity issue um, is, is significant. Um, but the other side of this dynamic of populations, low fertility, higher aging populations, is the nature of where a country is deriving its revenue and the types of tax base, oops, tax base that it's, it's getting it from. So if you're getting it from a corporate types of, uh, of tax bases that some countries are doing, in other countries it's from services, whatever the mixture might be, and in some cases you have a few countries experimenting with sin taxes like Thailand, historically, but now the Philippines, um, to what extent that's actually used for the social services, this is where the innovative finance is going to come in because if, as in Japan, if your, your productive sector starts to decline, it has a, a, certainly a huge impact on your payroll taxes um, and that leads to a whole set of questions that have to be analyzed. It is affordable. 
it is not that you have to have the Cadillac or the Mercedes-Benz of the services that another country can do. UHC is, the beauty of UHC is that it has to be tailored to that country's socioeconomic um, situation, including their service delivery system, and a lot can be done. This is not, we use the word frugal innovation in WHO, which is, it's affordable to the countries. There's a lot of reverse innovation. Japan can learn from Bangladesh. There are a lot of interventions and ways of doing things that can be adapted. Um, and so that when we can look at Gini coefficients and look at the whole redistribution effects of UHC on one hand, which is what Japan did. Uh, it's a very egalitarian society. We see this in the Scandinavian countries. But it is a, often a very politically difficult issue in many countries. And it is about how to use that economic information back into that redistribution effect. And this is where the, the various methods of health financing become very, very important. And those countries that have experimented with that uh, um, can, can make a great deal of progress. Um, the, Countries do have the resources, and there are many examples right now of countries that are advancing on UHC, from Thailand to Turkey to Bangladesh to Sri Lanka. Uh, there are more and more countries who are, are, are taking the initiative. Uh, two days ago was UHC Day, where uh, the world celebrated a movement, an advocacy movement, to encourage countries to take bold action, uh, to be ambitious. Uh, a lot of that is around health financing, but as you can well imagine, that these are still difficult issues in many countries. The increases in GDP per capita also do increase, certainly, the probability of adopting UHC ultimately, uh, and that has also to do with the redistribution effects of income within the country, such as the Abuja types of declarations and others, where it is also a matter of allocating funds to the health sector, and, and whatever will make that argument to decision makers. Now, in Japan, we, again, this is just saying from what had been mentioned earlier, is that UHC was adopted at a time when the GDP was much less uh, uh, wealthy than it is today. And then long-term care insurance was adopted in 2000, really in response to uh, uh, the, uh, the needs of the population. Now, from Japan, again, the traditional way of, of working was how UHC was instrumental to expanding the middle class. And there was a growth strategy and a social security net that had been put into place and progressive taxation and UHC as a, both a, a programmatic approach and policy approach, but ultimately did create the safety net for the population. In the UK, it was the NHS. In Canada, it was in 1960 in Saskatchewan and beyond. And then Chile in 1951, actually, as well. So this is uh, one model, let's say. But as we go into the future, um, there's a lot of concern about the middle class, uh, this is a bit more detailed and, and won't go into it here, but there is now in many countries the erosion of the financial situation for the middle class and both the elderly as well as generally speaking, and we've certainly seen the effects of this, so that it's starting to change where the, the fundamental economic strategies have to change. And it's certainly we're seeing in the, both of the 2008 and the financial crisis is that a lot more attention to Social Security reform, how to do this, how do you pay for this. Uh, there's there's a, the ongoing debates between the family and the state responsibilities. There's tax reform taking place at the same time. There's a whole set of concerns about population policy, particularly for those countries with low fertility rates. Again, economic analysis underneath each of these is going to be absolutely essential but it is ultimately that a great deal of concern of the financial burdens on the younger generation as well as their savings rates. But this has a, some, also some potential for innovation of how you engage that younger population, both as health workers, uh, as ways to support poorer families and creating incentives that might lead to reduced hospitalization for an older person. We've seen some of those models around the world. So there is space for innovation that you can actually add economic evaluation to it that actually can make the case. And that is essential from going from a pilot stage higher up the chain. Um, there's a lot to learn from Japan, and, uh, and I think this is certainly true in this audience where it's a combination of fiscal measures, organizational measures, uh, user, you know, fee schedule, not all of which are adaptable or transportable to other countries, but there's still nevertheless a lot to learn uh, across countries. And 
again, a lot of effects that one can point to, and I think this is a reminder of the types of effects you wish to document in order then to translate that in a political environment uh, to the various decision makers. Uh, and some of these are about social values, but so is universalism under UHC, for instance. And ultimately, one would argue, has a stabilizing a effect on society. We did see this partially with the Arab Spring. We saw it with the riots in Sao Paulo uh, two years ago, uh, where there are social instabilities that do derive when um, uh, the safety net isn't there, and aging is going to create a lot of issues. So financial sustainability, as I mentioned, is something that needs to be really thought through up early and has to deal with efficiency and health spending. Uh, we certainly know about financial protection. I think we know this. Uh, just to let you know, for those who don't, is that the OECD has something called the Senior Budget Officers Network, which is a way of bringing together the senior budget officers, the permanent secretaries of ministers of finance and budget, together with health, uh, largely in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, uh, sorry, in, in Europe. Uh, the one in Asia actually is based in uh, Thailand, but they have not yet brought together the health and the uh, uh, senior budget officers, and it's something we are trying to discuss with the OECD, that aging would be a perfect opportunity, given the region, to bring that analysis there as an opportunity to work on that issue. So that's just for your information. There's a lot of discussions and evidence historically around the demographic dividend. You'll hear this terminology, and that it was certainly true in 1960 to 1990, but we're entering a new world, as I've already mentioned. And so some people are starting to fear this demographic tax. Now, this is a conceptual issue that I, I challenge you to start thinking about, uh, to start to putting that into some kind of perspective, because it's not looking backwards, where the past is not the prologue. It is the fact that there are really some very dis important impacts on growth, on health, on healthcare expenditures as well as to the goals of UHC, which is preventing financial hardship, ultimately, that need to be considered. There are a lot of very important policy implications. There is, on, as you heard earlier from Professor Mills, is that the whole issues of behavioral change, what types of policies are going to lead to that behavior, what kind of behavior change do you wish? Some of it is around the workforce, and it has to do with who is in the workforce. Uh, just uh, actually today, there's a meeting in Geneva uh, which follows from the UN high-level meeting of um, employment and the health workforce. This was a UN commission uh, under the auspices of the Secretary General that WHO, ILO, and the OECD tried to make the argument for more health workers as an employment argument, that this is a big sector. It employs people, um, and trying to get more incentives and more structures and policies in place. The same is true for the aging workforce, which has been less studied, both as an aging workforce, but also the implications of aging for that workforce. And it is not doctors. It is nurses, it's physical therapists, occupational therapists, home health workers, social workers. And that is something that is new. And there's been a little bit of analysis in the uh, developed countries and almost none in the developing countries. And this is something that's absolutely essential that we're trying to work on as well, but is very, very important. Human capital, I suspect, will re-enter the conversation a bit because it is about the investments in education, not only for the younger population, but for the silver colleges, as we see here in Japan. What is the return on investment for all of this work is going to be very, very important. And of course, early childhood education and nutrition uh, is, is essential, as, as Sir Michael Marmot has argued, uh, for the longer life uh, span. Pension reforms is beyond the, the, certainly the remit of WHO, but I certainly wish to, Philip O'Keefe from the World Bank has highlighted is essential both to provide financing for innovation, but also uh, there's a lot that needs to be considered, including taxes on workers. And it ultimately is how do you reorient the healthcare system that I've mentioned. This is not for the discussion currently, but just to say that there are some efforts of trying to look at healthy life expectancy globally. Uh, it does need more work. Professor Saito here in Japan has been working with a working group on this for, for many years uh, in the European Union and, and WHO European office has been working on this and a number of other countries, but uh, I think it's an interesting area academically and, and practically to how to take this uh, further, but it is then trying to do that analysis in a, in a given country and this is more of a scatter diagram, but that how to 
look at impacts on revenue and trying to make that argument on return for investment, which is what the parliamentarians and the decision makers in finance will always want to see. Um, there's also still a, a, an interesting debate that goes on as to whether it is aging itself that is the cause of very high health expenditures. And it's a debate that is not settled. In some countries like the United States, it is very much about the last several years that drives healthcare expenditures. But in other countries, it isn't. And so I think it's very important to try to understand the factor of uh, the proximity to death and its effect on uh, both healthcare expenditures, but also on use of long-term care systems, which are then the driver for those costs. Uh, clearly, again, if you go back to that functional diagram, if you reduce that functional period of very ill health, then you're also reducing the exposure to various needs and healthcare expenditures. The, and, and so this is, again, uh, a lot of debate. Uh, some of this was documented in that recent World Bank uh, report, uh, Live Long and Prosper, but there's a similar one done in Europe. Um, naturally, in individual countries, there's perhaps a great deal more uh, of analysis on this, whether it's Japan or the UK. Uh, or Canada and the OECD has done some work on this. But uh, for the middle-income countries, the, the inputs are going to be a bit different than the developed countries because of the nature of employment, the nature of the tax base, um, as well as the nature of the healthcare system and who's paying for what types of services. So this does really need to be put into the context of individual countries. Um, what's also, there's been analysis looking at both the OECD countries and the BRICS countries, which is Brazil, Russia, um, India, uh, South Africa, as well, um, and that you can look at, again, the, what, to what extent aging explains the share of increases in health spending. Uh, you'll see some differences, it was 12%, I believe, in, in the OECD and 8%, I think, in the BRICS for this particular slide. What was interesting is Korea, and this was largely attributable to the use of technology, and this was one of Phillips's major points, that it was actually technology that was the driver of healthcare costs, not the fact that you had an aging population. And so it's certainly Korea has a very growing aging population, but when you look at it against Japan, it is also striking that Japan has a much more robust user fee schedule. And so what actually explains some of these uh, types of, of, of issues is something that needs analysis. So China and India, roughly the same population, but Again, what's, what's happening here needs to be further analyzed. Um, and again, this is more about the technology impact and, and trying to see an aging input versus more this technology types of, uh, of, of impact. Now, of course, technologies are used for aging populations as well, so how this gets disentangled is, is an interesting question. There is, this is actually an important statement, which is that the impacts of some of these changes on the health behavior of the, of the elderly themselves is not yet truly understood, or even on providers in the developing world, largely because either the growth is relatively recent or it hasn't been studied very much. And so this is on issues of access, on financial protection, their health status. It's been done for poorer populations, but it not, has not been done on the elderly, largely because it's a new phenomenon. Uh, and and again, this is in the developing, the middle-income countries. Now, the other telling issue is that this is where 90% of the growth of aging populations will be in the next 20 to 50 years. So this is really for those countries that it becomes really quite prominent. And so that there are also, how do you design your financial protection measures that are part of UHC, but for this particular population? It's a longer conversation. Uh, there are, I mean, China right now is, truly uh, jiving into this issue because of what it's dealing with, uh, both in terms of its growing aging population, but they have a national policy on this, they're really working on it, but they're also very honest saying that we don't really have a lot of answers, and so there's a real opportunity here for learning across countries about, well, what could work and how do you measure that and how do you then share some of that data uh, could be really quite useful. Um, and, and this is, again, it's an underexplored area, whether it's on expansion of health insurance and what, what types of social insurance or health insurance, what kind of impact would that have? Uh, household income, what are the effects on household income growth uh, by working on this population? The relationship between life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. Those are gonna be more diverse in developing countries because their root 
situation is going to be different. They may have had more poverty and, and, and more um, uh, distress over the years in that population. So, and the same is true that their health systems may not be as well developed as developed countries where the coordination of care that's necessary won't be there necessarily, um, and, and so on and so forth on the drug procurement. So a few then key lessons, and these are again, I, I really like to attribute this to Professor Takemi, who's, who's really a, a visionary here in Japan, but I think it holds true from Japan, but I think it has some important insights for the rest of the world, that it, UHC is a policy package, and it's both economic growth and social safety net. Again, going back to that SDG slide, that this isn't just done by health economists. It has to be done almost as a team effort uh, with other types of economists and policymakers and political scientists, I would argue, that also tries to tackle the issue of both income redistribution, healthcare expenditure um, uh, control, and meeting the needs of the society and the people themselves, and therefore involves the politics side. Health insurance systems are certainly quite diverse, uh, but it also then, again, the political economy is how to bring in the issues of the interest groups. Uh, and the fact that Japan did introduce UHC when it had a per capita GDP of about 4,000 US dollars. So it was possible, and I think that's a key message. Long-term care insurance uh, certainly was replicated in Korea. Uh, but how you actually introduce it uh, is a very important question depending on the country. Health policy should not be designed separately from other policies, uh, certainly is true. Again, I, I want to reemphasize this issue of social welfare because these are two different professional communities, two different power bases. A doctor and a, and a social worker will make vastly different sums of money in most countries. So those are the real issues that will get in the way of, of trying to design the perfect system. And countries need to design a UHC-based um, system, also thinking about long-term care, which is, again, a new concept that's only starting to evolve and has a, a lot of uh, planning to be considered. Um, how you use a demographic dividend as an argument, but how you measure it, how you measure the healthy life expectancy, how you measure the impact are all going to be clearly important. And sorry for the typo there, is that the both e the economic and the equity analyses together with the political economy and with decision science as a package, I, I think are going to be necessary as we proceed into the next uh, many years. Uh, just a word or two about the, uh, w for the WHO Kobe Center, for those of you I think who do know is that we have a new 10-year strategy that tries to look at this space between UHC innovation and aging populations. And so we hope to try to nurture some of the, the analytical work with our colleagues, both in WHO in Geneva and the regional offices, as well as with academic partners around the world to really tackle some of these really big issues of sustainable planning for UHC, as well as looking at the more specific technological social innovations and models of care. And that's where you can find us. Thank you very much. Thank you.